escape his age. If you go back up into verse 2, some object that the text only has three couplets. Therefore, six divine attributes or virtues here. Well, it's been pointed out by others that although that's true in the Masoretic text, you've got three couplets which would equal six references then, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, one, two, three, four, spirit of knowledge and a fear of the Lord, five, six. Where's our seventh one? You see, if you count those, you've got wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and fear. Six attributes and not seven. So they say, there's, there's no way that this is a reference to the seven spirits of God or that John in Revelation 1-4 is referring to the seven spirits or referring by that to Isaiah 11 and verse 2. And so others have said, well, although this is true that you have three couplets, thus six attributes in Isaiah 11-2 in the Masoretic text, in the Septuagint translation, which on a few occasions is more reliable, you have a seventh one. You have a seventh one, which is godliness. You don't have that in the King James because they translated from the Masoretic text. Well, that would give us seven virtues. But my problem with the Septuagint translation here, I don't follow that. My problem with it here is it breaks what appears to me to be obvious parallelism. To have a seventh one, you'd almost have to have an eighth one because we do have couplets here. It's the spirit of wisdom and understanding, spirit of counsel and might, spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, spirit of godliness. You broke the whole Hebrew parallelism here. You broke the train of thought. You broke the literary device that's being used here. To say the least, you'd have to have spirit of godliness and something else, and you don't have that in the Septuagint. So I'm going to stay with the Masoretic, and I always did earlier anyway. I'm going to stay with what we have here, that godliness is not in the original. And yet, however, we still have seven spirits mentioned here. Let's count them, okay? Verse 2, and the spirit of the Lord, number one, shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, number two, and the spirit of understanding. Obviously, spirit influences both of those, wisdom and understanding. Three, the spirit of counsel, four. The spirit of might, five. The spirit of knowledge, six. And the spirit of the fear of the Lord, seven. You really do have seven times spirit is referred to here in verse 11, or verse 2 of chapter 11. So I do believe that John has in mind this passage. We know that John's dealing with end-time material in the book of Revelation, and we know what Isaiah is dealing with. Isaiah 11 is a millennial messianic prophecy. And when you look at spirit, although you might just have the word spirit four times here in this verse, whenever you add it in the second occasion of each of those three couplets, then you add three There are three couplets. You add three to your four times spirit appears, and you've got it seven times. The spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of the Lord, who is, we could say, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, fear of the Lord. All this makes up the one Holy Spirit. You see, if you're going to go over to Revelation 1 or 3 or 4 or 5 and say we're talking about seven spirits or, you know, seven real angels or seven real... um, uncreated holy spirits then you're going to get at least four or perhaps six or perhaps seven over here in isaiah 11 too then you've got one spirit that's called the spirit of the lord then you have another totally different being called the spirit of wisdom and another one called the spirit of understanding no this simply represents the plentitude or the abundance or the fullness of divine attributes in the one single divine holy spirit Well, the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom. No, it's not as though the Holy Spirit fears the Father or the Holy Spirit fears the Son, but the Son operates in the fear of God because the fear of God is what 
it's what brings godliness and righteousness in our life. So whenever he's going to judge, it's going to be judge, judgment done in the fear of the Lord. In other words, according to the exact and righteous standards of God the Father himself. If we live in the fear of the Lord, we're living according to God's standards. And whenever he judges, remember what this is really talking about is it's in a context of him judging the earth. And he's going to have to have a fullness of divine attributes and perfections to righteously judge the earth. And so sure enough, he will have them. I don't intend this morning on in attempting to interpret each one of these, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, but you can see how all of these, even the spirit of might, will apply in Christ's judgment. Where if you, if you, if you have um, a pusillanimity of spirit and you're trying to judge a situation, you know, as a coward, you kind of back away. You need the spirit of divine might to make the judgment, make it accurately, not be afraid of the consequences, not as though the son would ever be afraid of them, but it's simply representing that God possesses all of these divine attributes. And the son is going to judge millennially and function in the fullness of those divine attributes. Let's see, I, I thought I might have you turn over to Revelation 17. I'm not even going to try to interpret this either. You know how we have to do in this church. There's so much to say that you can't say everything in one message. Sometimes you have to get a little ahead of yourself, like we do in theology all the time. We're still way back in introduction and epistemology, and you already know a whole lot about various theological doctrines because we use them as examples as we go along, just to better prepare you for them whenever we get there. But I find something that's somewhat analogous, maybe not terribly so, but somewhat in Revelation 17, if you look at verses 10 and 11, I wonder what your interpretation of this would be. It's not very easy, by the way. It's really not. Uh, well, let's go back earlier. We've really got to get back to what the whole vision is about here. Verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of of names of blasphemy, having seven heads <clears throat> and ten horns. Verse 9, the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. So he identifies the seven heads as seven mountains, but he gives them evidently a second identification. They can have a twofold significance. Those seven heads are also, verse 10, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, there's seven kings, right? Five falling, fallen, one is presently, and one is to come. Five plus two is seven. And look at verse 11, though. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Well, I didn't even know there was an eighth, because you just told me that the seven Heads represent seven kings. The beast that was and is not even is the eighth, but watch this, and is of the seven. Well, how can you be number eight and be of numbers one through seven? Well, I believe I know the interpretation of that, but suffice it to say here that somehow he's kind of expanded and contracted. So you can go over there, in other words, people say seven spirits, but you only find six attributes over there and then you're saying well the seventh one is the holy spirit but that's what we're trying to say what are the seven spirits well there's an expansion and a contraction so one holy spirit with the fullness of attributes and only six are mentioned there and yet they stand for the seven spirits of god in other words you don't have a seventh attribute if we were to mark up here spirit number one number two number three number four we'd go down that list of fear of the lord understanding might and then we'd get down here, and we wouldn't have a lot, and we'd just say, the Holy Spirit. We'd say, well, that's what all these things are up here. I know. That's kind of what Revelation 17 is saying, too, though. How can you be the eighth, and you're of Numbers 1 through 7? Eight comes after seven. Well, John knows that, so he must have something else in mind. That's what makes Revelation... You say, I thought you taught us back when we first started this that Revelation is easy to understand. <laughs> that it is a revelation. It's not something that is hidden. Well, it is a revelation, but there are things in it that are not the easiest things to interpret or understand. And Revelation 17, I think, is one of those. Maybe Revelation 1-4 is. 
seven spirits of God. Evidently it is to some people, but I don't find it terribly complicated myself. Now, I don't mean to imply that Isaiah 11, 2 refers to all or gives, let's, let's say it this way, that these are the only attributes of God. But seven means that Jesus possesses the fullness of the Godhead, which Paul tells us he does in Colossians 2, 9, that the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus bodily. So, just to briefly review, if you forgot where we are or why we're on what we are, we were asking the question, why seven? Why the number seven? Well, first of all, it's a biblical number with significance. Secondly, because John has Isaiah 11, 2 in mind. All right, then let's go on to uh, what I said would be our second vital question to raise. First of all, why the number seven? And now, what about those torches and eyes? What about those torches and eyes? Well, no doubt, this is a direct allusion to Zechariah's prophecy. Chapters 3 and 4. So you'll need to turn over there and we'll do a little study and teaching out of this for a moment or two. No doubt this is a direct allusion to Zechariah 3, especially verses 8, 9, and 10. And Zechariah 4, well, the entire chapter, which would be 1 through 14. Wait a minute before you turn over there. Go back to Revelation chapter 11. It is interesting that John elsewhere in Revelation makes use of this very same passage, Zechariah 4. If he made use of it later on, maybe he made use of it earlier. And I believe he certainly did. Revelation 11 and 4. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. That is before the God of the whole earth. Revelation 11, 4. That's a direct allusion back to, not a quotation, but an allusion, a direct one back to Zechariah 4. Standing before the God of the earth. And he means, if you're God of the earth, you're God of the whole earth. And remember in Revelation 5, 6, these seven eyes are the seven spirits which are sent forth into the whole earth. That will be significant also in Zechariah. A lot of this, you see, all of this is prophecy, so some of it is a little bit uh, difficult whenever we get into it and have to untangle this. Now, Zechariah has a series of visions. He has his uh, fourth one in chapter 3. He has his fifth one in chapter 4. Uh, I don't need to give you the places where the others are found, but he has a series of visions. He has an angel with him called the angel that talked with me, or we sometimes refer to it as the interpreting angel, who helps interpret the divine significance of some of the things that Zechariah is a witness to. And in chapter 3, I guess we'll start with that. It's hard to know exactly where to start because there's so much material here. He has a vision of a heavenly court scene where the accused, Joshua, who is the high priest of the post-exilic uh, nation of Israel, the exiles who have returned from Babylon and who himself represents the whole nation, is standing before the bar in heaven and the angel of the Lord or Jesus Christ is the defense attorney and an adversary, Satan, is the prosecuting attorney. And he, and he witnesses this whole scene here, how the Lord in his mercy and in his grace strips off of these defiled, strips off these defiled clothes uh, that belong to Joshua that represent the sinfulness of the nation of Israel. He says, are you not a brand plucked out of the fire? In other words, I have redeemed you not due to your own works, but I have saved you by my own power and election, by my own divine choice. And he beautifies him in verse 5, for he said, And let them set a fair miter, literally it's a turban and not a miter, but a fair turban upon his head. So they set a fair turban upon his head and clothed him with garments, so that he does indeed look like Israel's high priest. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, 
If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Verse 8 gets into the appropriate material. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest. This is not Joshua of Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. This is post-exilic Joshua. Thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men of a sign, the Hebrew says in the margin. They are men of a sign. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now we just read about that in Isaiah 11.1. 1. John has it connected to both of these Old Testament prophecies here. And they're both messianic prophecies and they're both millennial prophecies. For behold the stone that, if you're going to capitalize, the King James translators did branch, all capital letters, you ought to do that to stone as well. You know how often the figure of the stone is used in Messianic prophecy. Jesus is the stone that if you fall upon him, then he'll mold you into his image, First Peter chapter 2, but if you rebel and he falls on you, he'll crush you. And like Psalm 118 talks about the fact that the religious leaders would reject and they will down to the last day. They will reject the cornerstone and that stone will fall on them and crush them. So I don't know why they didn't capitalize stone, but most people believe this also is a messianic reference just like, because that's the context, just like branch is. Behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Now watch this, friends. Upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Uh Uh-oh. I mean, that sounds just like the book of Revelation. Where did John get that idea of seven eyes and the lamb? Jesus isn't a lamb. A lamb is just a figure representing him. He's not a stone either. They're both things, figures that represent him. And they both have eyes, and they both have seven eyes. And the seven eyes, John defines, they are the seven spirits of God. So if the seven spirits of God are the Holy Spirit, then these seven eyes on this one stone would be the same thing as the seven eyes on the Lamb in Revelation 5, 6b. That is the Holy Spirit. Behold, I will engrave the gravings thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Well, he's going to do it at the second advent. In one day, the spirit of grace and supplication as this same prophet goes on in a later chapter to tell us, will be poured out upon them. And they will mourn as one mourns for his only son. In that day, if you want proof that it's end time millennial prophecy, didn't happen by... You see, some people say that this happened at the crucifixion. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. Well, I don't read of any iniquity in Israel being removed at the crucifixion. There's a potential for it there, but it wasn't because they rejected it. But look at verse 10. It will tell us when he's talking about. And that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Now, if you know know the Old Testament, you know that's a phrase found often, like in 1 Kings 4, one other place I just remember off the top of my head where it's found. And it it signifies God's pleasure in prospering the nation of Israel spiritual prosperity and in every way under the vine and under the fig tree vine and fig representing the agricultural abundance that the nation of israel so greatly depended upon and it is a millennial reference all right so all i'm saying right now is that john has taken his reference to seven spirits seven eyes which are the seven spirits from the seven eyes of zechariah three nine and I guess something else I want to say here in Zechariah 3, 9 is that the stone has the eyes. Remember, it's the son or it's the lamb who has the eyes. Revelation 3, 1, Revelation 5, 6. One stone has seven eyes in it. All right, then in chapter 4, we get into a fifth vision. And here he has a vision of, of a lampstand. It's, got, it's like a candelabrum, seven branches that go out. You almost have to draw a picture of it to describe what he is really seeing. The very top of it, it has a huge bowl which serves as a reservoir for the oil. 
and connected from the bowl to the seven branches on the candelabrum are seven golden pipes through which the oil flows to supply the oil for the seven lamps. And standing by the lampstand are two olive trees. Well, I wonder what the idea there is. Well, obviously, you get your oil from your olives crushed from the olive tree. So it's a fullness of supply, both the divine bowl and the olive trees that stand by. So with that in mind, let's read some here in Zechariah 4. The angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof. Notice it's seven, seven, seven. Seven lamps, seven bowls, seven pipes, and two olive trees by it. Now, that's what John has reference to in Revelation 11:4. One upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. And I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. He somehow is identifying at least some of the imagery that we've just seen with the Holy Spirit. Where has the Holy Spirit been mentioned thus far in chapter 3 or 4? I haven't seen the Holy Spirit yet. And yet he's saying, here's what you've seen signifies. It won't be by might or power, that is by human intervention or by human accomplishments or by human means. It'll be by the Holy Spirit. Who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel thou shalt become a plain. He shall bring forth the headstone, that is the capstone that signifies the completion of the building, whatever one is building. And here, of course, it would be the second temple. He'll bring forth the headstone thereof with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. You know, praising God that they're through with the work of the building of the temple. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. The same thing John says in Revelation 5, 6. Seven eyes or seven spirits sent forth into the whole earth. Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the lampstand and upon the left side thereof? But I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. See, that's why I added in over there in Revelation 11:4, where it said these are the two that stand before the Lord of the earth. It's of the whole earth because that's what Zechariah says in Zechariah 4:14. All right, so what do we have here? Well, let's get into just uh, a little bit of interpretation, some of the background here. We are dealing with the return of the exiles, and I think most of us in this church, we've certainly taught enough on it over the years, know something of the historical context and frustrations that the returning exiles experienced in their attempt to rebuild the temple. Some of it was due to their own... Um, sluggishness, putting off the building of the temple, as Haggai tells us, so they can concentrate on building their own houses. Some of it is due to opposition they receive from the Samaritans that the post-exilic books certainly talk about. We know that the construction of the very temple itself was far inferior 
so in fear that when some of the older men who had witnessed both temples, seen them both, saw it, they cried. And so God has to encourage the people here in verse 10 by saying, who hath despised the day of small things? The temple didn't begin to compare. We've talked about the measurements of it before. It didn't begin to compare, compare with the glory of the temple of the Solomonic era. Solomon's temple was a glorious, beautiful thing, all in white and then clothed with marble around it. Josephus said that um, Herod's temple, whenever they began doing Herod's, which was kind of a reconstruction or a refurbishing or expanding of this one, was somewhat like Solomon's in that when you came over in the morning, the top of the Mount of Olives, traveling from the east to the west, you were blinded by the brilliance of the temple, the white that was used, the white stone that was used, and the gold that was used. Well, I don't know that this is true, though, with the post-exilic temple here. It was rather a small thing. It had to be so small that the elder men who had seen Solomon's, gone into captivity, lived through it, and returned, wept, wept whenever they... The other people were glad. The old people wept whenever they saw it like, this is what we have returned to? Is this a sign of God's displeasure with us? Well, not really. That's what God is trying to say. He's trying to encourage them that although it doesn't appear to be as good, if you'll just be faithful to me, you'll be as blessed, if not more so, than the nation of Israel that came before you. So the historical situation is a context of the frustrated attempt of theirs for these various reasons I've just mentioned to uh, build the temple whenever they return from Babylon. And so the visions that are given, especially this one here in chapter 4, are signifying the fact that divine aid will enable them to accomplish this great task. And God's prophet Zechariah encourages both Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who as a descendant of King David, and Zerubbabel was, if you check his genealogy, uh, represents the kingship in Israel. He encourages these two men as the two who stand as the Lord's anointed ones with regard to the nation of Israel. This is seen in verse 14. These are the two anointed ones those two olive trees standing beside the bowl on top of the seven-branched candelabrum. What are those or who are those? That's Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who although he was not a king, Zedekiah was the last king in Judah. He represented kingship because he was a direct descendant from King David. And so what the Holy Spirit is trying to say here through these visions is that the force behind their success or the force behind their accomplishment of this task will be nothing less and will be none other than himself, God the Holy Spirit. And that is seen in the well-known verse, Zechariah 4 and verse 6. It's not by might or power, that is by human enablement, it is by my spirit. And it will be by my spirit directly working through his prophets and by his spirit, as he mediates his aid and direction through Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, who represents the kingly office. Now, what about the oil here? Well, obviously, the oil represents a continuous supply of divine aid, both to and through his anointed ministers. A continuous supply of divine aid. There is a bowl at, top, at the top of the candelabrum that is filled to the full with oil. The eyes, what do they represent? Well, this brings us full circle then back to the book of Revelation. Seven eyes represent the omnipresence of God, the Holy Spirit. And what does omnipresence represent? It's interesting that omnipresence is not only an attribute that uh, stands generally in a long sentence with some other omnis, but it's almost one that represents the others. Omnipresence. Eyes, seven eyes represent fullness of vision, that everything comes under the gaze or the vision of God. Nothing can escape his attention. To the 
returning exiles, I think one thing he's saying here is that I, I see fully what you're going through. You returning exiles here in the land of Judah. Seven eyes. I see fully what you're going through. That They were to take this as encouragement to them. I see what you're going through. I see the Samaritans. To and through the ministers here, I see the complacency of the people who want to build their own homes instead of build my temple. God is in, he has full cognizance and he fully recognizes all of that. But what omnipresence, I think, goes on to signify is both omniscience and omnipotence. God not only sees, but that means if he sees or he is present everywhere, then he knows everything going on everywhere. And he also possesses the power to do something about what he sees. God is fully aware of all the situations and struggles in Judah because he is the God who is present everywhere at all times. There's so much. This teaching is so rich that John is giving us. Seven spirits, seven lamps, or torches burning with fire, seven eyes. Torches, I haven't said much about them. Obviously, they fulfill evidently more or less the same function as eyes. Torches lit with light signify illumination. That the eyes of God might see. But God can, there's nothing, there's no darkness with God. There's nothing hidden from him. If something is in the dark, we can't see it, metaphorically or realistically. If something is in the back of the closet and it's dark, you can't see it, can you? But with God, before his throne, there are seven burning torches. There's nothing in the dark with him. For the continuation of this... But with God, before his throne, there are seven burning torches. There's nothing in the dark with him. There is no darkness. He, his eyes, his gaze penetrates everything. Why? Because God is light. He can see everything. That's what the torches signify in Revelation 4, 5. But some more on the eyes here. God's present everywhere at all times. First, to bless his people, and secondly, to judge his enemies. This is all intertwined together. Let me ask you this. How or why or on what basis can Jesus so righteously judge as we know he will from Isaiah 11? You say, well, through these sevenfold perfections of the Holy Spirit. That's exactly what we're saying. And because the sevenfold perfections of the Holy Spirit are represented through seven eyes, Jesus can see everything. He is omnipresent. The eyes represent the fact that he is everywhere by the power of the Holy Spirit. Being there, he knows all things, and he can do all things. That is, he can do what he pleases. There are some verses in the New Testament, or in the Old Testament, rather, that teach on the subject of God's eyes that, in fact, it does represent the omnipresence as well as the omniscience as well as the omnipotence of God such as if you'll turn over to Second Chronicles. We won't look at all these. I'll just look at one or so in each section and mention another one or two. Second Chronicles 16, 9. This teaching, in other words, in the Old Testament is really not that complete until you get to the book of Revelation and you come out of the shadows into the light and you find out what's really being referred to back here. You see, it's the Holy Spirit who is the sent one. He's before the throne. He's distinct, I said, from the Father in the throne. And he is scripturally subservient to the one in the throne. The Spirit never sends the Father. The Father sends... The Spirit never works through the Father. The Father works through the Holy Spirit. Second Chronicles 16, 9, For the eyes of the Lord. And how many eyes does he have? Seven. In other words, it's a reference to God the Holy Spirit. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He has to use words speaking as a man. Eyes, God doesn't have eyes. Run to and fro, they're everywhere in an instant of time. They don't have to go from point A to get to point B. And here's the purpose, to show himself strong. Omnipotence, to show himself strong. 
in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And how would he know whether your heart is perfect toward him? He's omniscient. He knows all things. They're, all, they're joined together. Omnipresence, the eyes. He's everywhere to show himself strong. He's omnipotent. He can do whatever you need him to do. He could do whatever needed to be done with the returning exiles there to accomplish that great work. Omniscient to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart he has already penetrated and discerned. And in Psalm 34 and verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro again, and his ears are opened unto the righteous. But also there is a converse to this. He is the God who's present everywhere at all times, not only to bless his people, but to judge his enemies. And the scriptures are even almost more numerous here. Job 34, 21, Psalm 11, 4, his eyelids try the children of men, we read. His eyelids try. It's that Holy Spirit in his full perfection that he will minister, administer through the Son, Jesus Christ, who has been appointed, John 5, 22, as the eschatological judge. The Father judges no man, Jesus said. He's committed all judgment into the hands of the Son, and the Son will do it expertly, according to Isaiah 11, 2, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 33, 14, Proverbs 5, 21, you probably know Proverbs 5:15, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. The eyes of the Lord, seven eyes represent omnipresence before the God of the whole earth, sent out into the whole earth. Jeremiah 16:17, Jeremiah 32:19. And how about, you can turn to this one in the New Testament, finally, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. So this is clearly how Zechariah 4.10 and Revelation 5.6 interpret the eyes, or the torches, we could say. It's easier for humans to conceive of... I mean, think of it like this. It's easier for humans to conceive of seven spirits being omnipresent than one spirit. Right? Because omnipresent means everywhere. And at least if you've got seven, you can be in seven different places at the same time. It's easier for a human to conceive of seven spirits being omnipresent than one. We find that very difficult to conceive of God being present everywhere. Well, what if he's seven in number? At least he can be on all seven continents then, right? Of course, he's not seven per se in number. He's just the divine spirit, Holy Spirit, who is everywhere at one and the same time. Hebrews 4.13, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. That's a rather sobering verse, is it not? Sobering on the order of Proverbs 15, 3, that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the good and the evil. Those who think they can hide in darkness, the Bible talks about those who say, God can't see, God isn't listening, God isn't watching. He is everywhere. And how does the Bible represent that? Through the seven spirits of God. It's not God the Father who's everywhere. He's on the throne. It's not God the Son. He's now seated on his throne. It's the blessed third member of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. The seven spirits of God, that's the active operating force of God in the world today. To bless God's people and to judge God's enemies. He can clearly discern because he's everywhere he can know everything, and he can know every single thing that's going on. That's a sobering thought. That God, let's say it like this, is both here and there. You say, where is there? Anywhere that here is it. God is both here and there. Here makes it really sobering, because wherever you say that, that's where you are. God is both here and there. And where is there? 
It's anywhere here isn't. It's everywhere here isn't that's there. And God is there. God is both here and there. He's everywhere. He beholds everything. His eyelids, Psalm 11, try the children of men. It's just a reference there to his omniscience and to his omnipresence. His eyelids try because he is everywhere. So maybe here's a concluding comment or two. The Lutheran aspect of the doctrine known as communicatio idiomatum, that attributes of the divine nature in Jesus, such as omnipresence, are now communicated to his glorified human state. It's simply a gross error and a gross distortion of the teachings of the New Testament and of the Word of God in its entirety. This was an attempt to theologically justify Luther's position on the communion, consubstantiation. Christ is both in, with, and other, under, or in, cum, et, sub, as the Latin would say, the elements of communion. Let me say that again if that went over your head. We talked about this in theology, communicatio idiomatum, the communication of divine attributes, there's an element of that that is true. But the Lutheran interpretation, the Lutheran use of that to prove their communion theory is simply a gross distortion of, of these very passages you see. Revelation 1, 4, Revelation 3, 1, Revelation 4, 5, Revelation 5, 6. That the divine attributes of the divine nature of Jesus are now communicated to the human nature of Jesus, one of those being omnipresence, therefore that meaning that Jesus now in his human nature can be present everywhere at the same time. Communicatio idiomatum, the communication of the divine attributes. We know that Jesus was and is one person with two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. He was that way on earth, he's that way now. But we know that on earth, he could have a communication of certain types of divine attributes to him as Jesus the man. He could have a communication of some of those attributes whenever he manifested his power or his knowledge. It was a communication of a small aspect of his omnipotence and of his omniscience. So they say, well, why can't it continue to be true? Jesus has now resurrected and ascended and he's at the right hand of God. But one of the attributes of deity is omnipresence, right? If you're God, then you're everywhere. That's one of the things that makes you God. That's one of the attributes of deity or of the Godhead. And so the Orthodox Reformed conservative theologian would say, well, yes, but that concerns Jesus' divine nature. And they say, well, yes, the Lutheran would respond, yes, but there's a communication of those attributes belonging to his divine nature to his human nature. So that whatever you say about him as a divine being, you can say about him as a human as well. Therefore, if God has as one of his attributes omnipresence, then that means Jesus now can be everywhere at the same time. And what I'm saying to you is that that is not only a gross error, it actually is in contradiction to what we're studying this morning, that Jesus has the seven spirits, and that is what makes him capable of being everywhere because it's not Jesus personally himself who's at the right hand of God, whoever lives to make intercession for us. It's Jesus through the presence and power and ministry and person of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the seven spirits of God. So whenever Jesus makes comments like this, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. He is there in the person of the Holy Spirit. There's not a communication now of divine attributes to the human nature that divine attribute here specifically being omnipresent present so that Jesus can be present everywhere. That was dreamed up as a theological excuse for Luther's view of the communion. You, if you've got churches all around Europe or Germany and you happen to have two of them on the same night partaking of communion, and since we know Jesus, you can't divide him up and have an arm here and an eyeball over there, 
How are you going to have him present in the communion, in, under, and with the elements in both places at the same time if he's at the right hand of God? Well, you dream up your Lutheran slant to the Greek doctrine of communicatio idiomata. The Greek theologians taught that, by the way, back in the early centuries, and it was a very important uh, aid in understanding, well, in particular, Jesus as he walked as a man. Because the Bible doesn't tell us that Jesus, the man, died. The Bible tells us that God shed his blood for us. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. So what, what do you have there but a communication of divine attributes to one or a communication of human attributes to the other? God can't die. Jesus died and he died as a man and yet his death as a man could also be called the death of God. God shed his blood for us and God died. If the princes of this world knew this, they would not have crucified the man, Christ Jesus. No, the Lord of glory. There was a communication of divine attributes. So that whenever Jesus said, I thirst, he was thirsty. There wasn't a half of him that was thirsty. Another half said, I'm God, I don't need to drink water. He himself, his whole self, was thirsty. There was a communication, a fathomless, mysterious communication of divine attributes or of human attributes to the person, the single one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he's unique in this regard. He's the only one of whom it can be said he's one person and two natures. The rest of us are one person, one nature. We have the nature of a human being. He's the only one who possessed fully the nature of God and fully sin accepted the nature of man. So when Jesus makes these statements to us, he's here by the seven spirits of God. Now that doesn't lessen in any way the fact that Jesus is here. But he's here in the power and in the person of the Holy Spirit. It's those seven eyes, remember, that are the seven spirits that are sent forth into the whole earth. The Son can't be sent forth into the whole earth. He's at the right hand of God making intercession for us. So how do we know that God is with us? By the seven spirits teaching, by the seven eyes teaching, by the seven burning torches teaching. It's the Holy Spirit in his ministry. Jesus said, I'll never leave you and forsake you. Well, he did leave us. He said, I'm leaving you, but I'll send you another one back just like myself. Amen. There's such a relationship between them that for the Holy Spirit to be here, Jesus could actually say, I am there in your midst. That's the closeness of their relationship there. And we've talked about that earlier here in this study as well. So where is God? He's both here and there. God is everywhere. That has some profound implications and ramifications to it. Aren't you glad now he said seven spirits and not the Holy Spirit? Because you would just say, all right, the Holy Spirit, and you'd just skip right over that, and I know what he's talking about, and go on from there. But when he calls him, them, the seven spirits of God, you either end up a heretic or you start digging in the word of God. See, I wonder what John, this wonderful New Testament prophet, what in the world is he talking about here? He has some tremendous insight into some Old Testament passages, Zechariah 3 and 4, Isaiah chapter 11. Well, I would warrant you learned something this morning. <laughs> you might have to go back and hear that message, or those, the seven messages on the seven spirits. <laughs> well, he... He can make use of the divine attributes as the Holy Spirit willed. It was all by the direction of the Holy Spirit. He lived in accordance with the will of the Father, and sometimes he'd make statements like, the Father himself is in me, and he doeth the works. Well, that's okay, but he doeth the works through whom or by whom? Through the Holy Spirit. The Father doesn't do that independently himself. He does it through the Holy Spirit. So he worked through, Jesus himself worked through the Holy Spirit who possessed all of the attributes. But Jesus wasn't walking around uh, fully conscious of uh, omniscience, knowing all things. He could exercise that as the Holy Spirit willed and know all things. And there were times that he couldn't. Like he did not know the date of his return. He said the Father, does, the Father knows it, the angels don't, and neither does the Son. 
At that moment when he said that, he did not know when he would return. How could God not know? It's because he, it was not the will of the Holy Spirit to give him that knowledge at that time. Yeah, he operated in complete dependence upon the Holy Spirit, in complete dependence on him. He said himself, of myself, I could do nothing. He said, it's the Father in me who doeth the works, and the Father does it through the Holy Spirit. Showing us, you see, that's what I believe about the whole mystery of all of that, and we'll teach on that in the faith studies on him being the second man or the last Adam or the second Adam. Showing us that, that we can do, he didn't come down here and operate as God only so that we could say, well, he was God. That's why he could have that type of faith or do that type of thing, and I'm just a man after all. He operated as a man under the authority of the Holy Spirit. Complete dependence on the Holy Spirit. Not in the unique way that he did then. No way. He's empowered for service there, and he's empowered for ministry. That Had he been empowered earlier, he would have gone out earlier. It's that Holy Spirit that empowers him for service and ministry. Whenever that, and whenever that happened, that's what it signifies. That's why you find him immediately going into the wilderness to be tempted and then coming out on the other side victorious right on into his ministry. And he does no ministry prior to that. So you would have to make a distinction then, uh, something along the line of, of what happens with a believer, that you can have the Holy Spirit, with you, but not have the Holy Spirit in you. You had the Holy Spirit in a different way, and you are uniquely equipped and empowered from that time forth. I'm not saying the Holy Spirit couldn't exert influence. He did on Jesus' whole life. Kept him free from sin, from the womb. He never had an evil thought, never had an unkind word, never did a sinful deed. You couldn't do that apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. But for service and for ministry, no, that's a different matter there. That's right. That's after being empowered. Let's see. I've got that in a teaching somewhere. I'm trying to think of where that is. My time has not yet come. You've never heard me teach on that, John 2? I'll have to look up. I've, already, I've got that down somewhere, so I better not say now, if I haven't already. My, I can't think of where that would be right now. i got a big file cabinet in there, though. <laughs> it's got a lot of notes in it for future teachings. John is the one who characteristically uses that phrase or his is the gospel in which that phrase is found. My hour's not yet come, my time is not yet come. And it almost always has reference to the crucifixion. And so, if it almost always does, maybe it always does. And maybe what Jesus is meaning there is that, you know, as soon as his hour had come as far as doing miracles, the hour that had not yet come was his death. You say, well, what's the relationship between that and John 2? Well, I think Jesus knew well enough to know that whenever he started doing the works that he did among those sinful Jews, that would result and lead to his death. And sure enough, it did. So it's my hour's not yet come. Well, his hour was there in the sense he's, he's now empowered to do the works of God, but he knows what it will result in his death. So maybe I've gotten ahead of the story to tell you that.
than hundred sheep if one is lost in the way will he not leave the rest in the wilderness to restore the one who is straight though your sins be as scarlet they shall be as white as The song says, where does that leave non-charismatic people then? He has left and he sent the Holy Spirit back. Where does that leave non-charismatic people then? It's very, very important to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In light of all that we've seen this morning, it's extremely important 
to have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, baptism, God has left you then. You are in one sense left alone. Because he said there's going to be a trade-off. I won't leave you alone, but I am leaving. So the trade-off must be I'm going to send me back to you in another form, in the Holy Spirit. And if he left and you didn't get anything sent in return, you got robbed of something. That's what the devil is doing, robbing a lot of people of their full participation with God in the baptism. He left and you're alone if you don't have the Holy Spirit. It's very important to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, grace and peace from all these wonderful members of the Godhead, the Father and the Spirit and the Son. Hallelujah. We'll see you next time then. Praise the Lord.